We are at Game Lab 2017, catching up with Mike, uh, legend, right. RPG, role-playing games legend. Can we say that? No, you can't, but <laughs> I, I'm getting teased about this now by my family, particularly my son is a designer as well. So you're like, can I talk to you now? Now that you're a legend? <laughs> Shut up. You can be a legend as well. Uh, he actually, because he's doing the Witcher role-playing game, we were in Poland, and he actually had fans, and he was so embarrassed. People were coming, going, will you sign my stuff? And he's going, oh, Dad, you can do this all the time. I'm going, yeah, that's why I hide in a room. <laughs> you know? Well, other than video game RPGs, of course, before there was the role-playing game, the classical, the, the, um, the text-based, and uh, yeah. Uh, so how was it to design role-playing games back in the 80s, specifically with Cyberpunk? What was interesting was that you had a lot of freedom. One reason, I started in video games and it was much harder. Uh, I was talking to, to Richard Garriott, who worked in the same place, and we were talking about how hard it was to like lay out all the pixels for these 8-bit games and a whole bit like that. It was very cumbersome. And role-playing games, you could you know, do it in your imagination and you could lay out a book and you could put everything together and see it happen and it wasn't anywhere near as complex. And there were no limits. So, you know, you could have an idea and, you know, bang away for, you know, five months, six months, whatever, and have something that was tangible. And then when people got it, they could go just start expanding on what you'd already started. Mm -hmm. So it was, it's very exciting. I still love doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, my wife kids that I would probably be designing games as soon as I finished the previous game until I was dead. You know? You're actually back in the business, in the traditional role-playing game back business. into the traditional role-playing game business. Uh, what happened was we downsized the company. I went to work for Microsoft during the uh, traditional game crash during the 2000s, early 2000s. And I worked back in video games again for about 15 years. And when I, my son graduated, he said, I want to be a game designer. And I said, really? I didn't talk you out of this? And he's actually quite good at it. So he wanted to do it. My wife wanted to get involved again. Uh, a lot of my people who used to work for me wanted to get involved. We had a whole bunch of people who had played or were involved. Uh, I have a couple of people from Wizard of the Coast. I have some people who came in from Microsoft uh, and you know other different companies. And they all said, we want to start doing this again. And you know we had money, we had time, and I was going to write games anyway. So you know it's, it's a bit of a stretch because I spend time between my stuff in Poland and working on 2077 and I also am writing stuff in the digital and paper realm as well but you know it keeps me busy. But there's also new technology that can help you with traditional role play yeah. games. Oh yeah definitely. Um, part of it is that you can think further for example we put in 3D printers and so when I design like a robot game now, I can actually get the robot design, have it printed out, and you know, have a sense of what everything looks like. And if I like it, I can send it off you know, with my production manager to, to Hong Kong and have it made. You know, where before, I had to wait forever. You know? How did you envision uh, Cyberpunk back in the day? And do you think that, because of course, traditional role-playing game is all about fantasy and imagination, mm -hmm. players imagining being there. Well, do you think that's going to be realized in a virtual environment with, with a video game? Yeah, well, the thing is, is that Cyberpunk is kind of made for doing a video game. And you know, from the beginning, I thought about it, but we didn't have the technology to really pull it off. You know, nobody did. And what we've now gotten is, uh, it's, it's like the first days of movies. We now have the equivalent of Technicolor film and really good sound and CinemaScope and all that. So now we can concentrate on doing stuff that will be really cool. But, you know, when we first started, we had to work with imagination because the tools just weren't there. You know, um, my favorite CDPR story, I uh, walked in at one point and they were working on Witcher 3. And one of the guys said, yeah, let me show you something we can do. And he said, it's fall, and he showed me this screen, and it was like this hillside and forest and a whole bunch like that. And he procedurally, by punching one button, generated not just the hillside and the wind, but animals and pathways and all this stuff, just bam. And he said, want to see it in winter? Bam. And the processing power involved was astounding. But also the way to think about it was that he's had set up this software to look at how the hill was constructed, where the wind was coming from, 
what the natural tendencies would be for all of his animals and things like that, and it would construct the whole thing. Mm -hmm. That's astounding because it makes a world that you can just then go play in. Mm -hmm. How has it been like working with uh, CD Projekt Red in, in terms of logics, logistics, uh, traveling back and forth, and how, how are you working on, on this uh, cyberpunk video game? Uh, what's interesting is uh, it actually goes both ways. I go over to Poland at least like two to three, sometimes four times a year. We used to, in the early days when we were starting, have you know like weekly and sometimes multiple weekly uh, long distance Skype conversations with the whole team, and we'd all be you know looking at bad cameras early in the morning and talking. And then um, they, in turn, you know, members of the team come out, and we meet with them out in Seattle as well. And um, in fact, about five, six months ago, um, one of the uh, production men, who actually, I guess he's a producer now, mm -hmm. and he came out and he and I spent a week just beating on ideas and experimenting and, you know, asking questions. And he just, you know, got everything I knew about it. And we, you know, we worked out how to do it, what things were important in the game, what was going to feel right. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I feel really lucky, actually, because, you know, I, I get to play with some really cool toys and I get to go hang with some really fun people. And, you know, when the sun goes down, we can go out and get a lot of really good Polish beer and vodka. It's even better. I know it's not the best time to spill the beans on, on secrets of the game, of course. It's oh. not the best time. No, it's not. It's never the best time. My joke is that there's a lot of very tall Polish people waiting to kill me if I say too much. And believe me, they're all taller than I am, so it's you know, kind of dangerous. But what, what can you tell us of that vision being real, realized? Uh, the vision is really pretty close to what I had in my head years ago. What was actually funny was when they did the trailer that everyone's seen now, I, I looked at it and said, oh my God, that's like perfect. Mm -hmm. And there were all these little weird touches from the game that were in the background because they're fans. So I look at it and go, oh wow, they really did that. You know, it's awesome. So the, the feeling has stayed the same and we've also, you know, been developing it and, you know, continually developing it to keep that feeling because they're fans too. One thing I find really interesting about the game is the classes. There are rock stars, the journalist mm -hmm. class, executive class. Mm -hmm. Can we really expect that to be in the game? Or would you yes. like? Yes. yes, you can. Uh, they're all going to be there, but I can't tell you more than you're going to find some surprises about how we've done it. And I think you're really going to like it. Uh, there's there's a lot of subtlety going on there, and um, a Adam and I spent literally, like I said, a whole week messing with some of the ways of, of implementing that, so you get the most you know feel for your character. It's really great. It's really great that we journalists are finally getting a class into video games. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, you know, you don't have a headset. You know, you've got a guy over there carrying a camera, but you know, it's a matter of time. <laughs> okay. So, overall. Of course, you know The Witcher very well, and other than the fantasy setting, the medieval fantasy setting, and the cyberpunk, you know, cyberpunk setting, uh, what can we expect in terms of uh, differences between both games without telling too much? Between cyberpunk or...? Yeah, cyberpunk and, and The Witcher. Oh, The Witcher. Um, well, the technology, what they're taking is Witcher's technology curve, which was staggering anyway, mm -hmm. and they're just building on it. They're just adding new, cooler things to it, which I think is, you know, the way to go. They have, an, with Red Engine, they have just some amazing techniques they can do. Um, I know Witcher, but more from the outside. And one reason is um, my son is working on the tabletop version of the game. So when he decided he wanted to do it and he worked the deal out with CDPR, I said, I'm not getting involved in this. I have enough work to do, and you do fantasy better than, you know, I do. And... Um, he and his mother, who's also uh, one of our writers, uh, they learned Polish. They read all the books. They're going to Witcher camp this year. I mean, they're hardcore. You know, uh, my wife walks around with like a Witcher pocket watch. <laughs> you know, and they're talking about all these people in all the books and all the movies, and they know it backwards and forwards. And I make a point of never asking them much because I don't want to be involved. I want them to go, you know, have a good time and do it. But they live and breathe this stuff. So I think uh, that's going to be a real fun project. What have you shared with the audience here about role-playing games and cyberpunk and what you've been doing? And what have I told them? Um, yeah. Well, what I'm working on now is I'm wrapping up a game called uh, Mecton Zero, 
which is taking a lot longer than I originally planned to do, but part of it was I didn't expect to be going to Poland like, you know, three times a year and working on another video game project. I just thought, hey, I'll go do this giant robot game. What's kind of cool is that as, you know, we've been delayed, I've actually started adding some really cool things. And um, this, cons this, this uh, entire uh, grouping has been really great because I've had a chance to talk to other designers and kind of, you know, try ideas out on them, get their take and so forth like that. For example, um, the designer of, of ICO and, um, you know, just... Where that's on. Yeah, it was on. I, I spent like, uh, you know, like a half an evening with, you know, badly trans, you know, translating between us, talking about like, you know, ideas about how to interact through a game. And I went away and just like wrote all night, like, yeah, we could do this cool thing. And, you know, so that was, you know, those sorts of interactions where designers can meet other designers is really great because we all get smarter. We all get more capable. Perhaps you two have to work together. I think you really like Japanese design. Uh, well, my company has done Bubblegum Crisis, Votoms, um, let's see, um, Dragon Ball Z. Uh, we are going to eventually do Gundam. We're, we're set up to do it. We just haven't really had time in translation. S and we did Teenage Matter Space, which is very, very anime. So, yeah, we, I started off you know, being very, very fond of anime. Um, some friends of mine and I started like one of the first Japanese animation magazines in the United States a long, 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 long time ago. So, you know, anime has always been near and dear to my heart. Mm -hmm. So, having a chance to work within, you know, a Japanese company would be, you know, definitely interesting. I want to kind of see the production. You're also a persona lover, I've heard. Mm -hmm. I like persona a lot, you know. Uh, I love the fact that basically they, they take the elements that would be in a, just a graphic, you know, novel style. And, you know, they basically have changed the interface to where you can affect things, but you also can get involved in the characters, have favorite characters, and, you know, be involved in how things structure. I like 4 probably best, Persona 4 probably best. Um, it's interesting because, again, it's a style we don't do very much in the United States. You know, we, we, we're, you know, like constantly looking at instant gameplay as opposed to maybe, you know, more cerebral gameplay. Mm -hmm. Okay, closing one. What about cyberpunk as a genre itself? Not this uh, specific game, mm -hmm. but cyberpunk as a style, right. as a genre, as a setting. Uh, was it the 80s, the golden age for it? Or do you think some creators yeah. are trying now to bring it back? They're and not to trying. They're not trying to bring it back. They're, it's coming back. You know, what's, uh, I'll tell you a story that's kind of interesting. Was, you know, my son didn't know what I did for a while. He thought I did video games. And then he and his friends stumbled across some of the games I did and they discovered cyberpunk. And they didn't want to play cyberpunk in a you know, more cerebral thing. They wanted the black leather jackets and the huge guns. And you know, the, it's like at one point CDPR did this uh, art piece and there's this guy wearing this insane 80s leopard skin blue jacket. And you know, I, I was laughing because Martin, uh, the president of CDPR is going, I want that jacket. And Cody's going, I want that jacket. And you know, what I noticed was that that was now cool. You know, it, it was coming back with a vengeance, mm -hmm. and it wasn't because it was just nostalgia. There was a certain level of coolness and just badassery that was, you know, coming back, and we were allowing ourselves to do it. So I don't think it's as much like, you know, nostalgia or we're trying to get it back. I think that people are rediscovering it. Okay, so hopefully the next time we meet, we're wearing some augmentations and chips and those kind of jackets. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, you too. Nice meeting you.